Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum. We're delighted to have a, a great crowd here, a very big crowd here, to uh, uh, have a really interesting conversation uh, that Eric Rosenbach will moderate with Jim Comey. So thank you all for coming. Uh, our guest tonight, Jim Comey, is known to everyone here certainly as a former director of the FBI, a graduate of the College of William and Mary in Chicago Law School, and with some uh, experience in a law firm, he then embarked on a career in public service as an assistant U.S. attorney, assistant attorney general, U.S. attorney, and then, of course, as director of the FBI. So we, we um, will be very in interested in the conversation that, as I said, will be moderated by Eric Rosenbach, who is, of course, our colleague here at the Kennedy School, the co-director of the Belfer Center, who in his own public service was uh, chief of staff at the Pentagon and assistant secretary. I also commend the other forums that we have this week coming up. It's a pretty busy week here at the Institute of Politics. I think they're on your program. We have really interesting ones coming up on Tuesday on racism in urban housing policy at six o'clock that evening. We'll have a viewing of the South Carolina debate at eight o'clock. On Wednesday, Toronto Burke will be here to accept the Gleitzman Activist Award. And on uh, Tuesday at four o'clock, the Institute of Politics will be hosting at five o'clock in Wexner Commons, uh, Ambassador Samantha Power and Dan Pfeiffer. So you look for the postings, a lot going on this week. We welcome you all here. Jim, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a great forum night when you have the place packed to the rafters. Uh, I'm a grad of the school. I was an MPP and graduated in 2004. And my fondest memories of the school are the nights when the forum was packed, there was someone interesting, and you were going to try to hear something that would challenge your ideas and kind of spur you to think a little bit more. Um, so tonight, we're going to be informal. Uh, Jim, thank you very much for coming, first of all. It's not always the case that someone who is as high profile as you are uh, comes to the forum and wants to share your experiences with the students and the community here at Harvard. And it, it really is part of the Harvard experience also to use this to learn. And so some of the questions I've put together will be a little bit of explanation because I'm trying to make sure that we get to the substance of some things. Um, but also just understanding your perspective. Most importantly, um, despite the fact that you are a pretty polarizing figure, I'm sure that's not news to you, um, you <laughs> have been a very dedicated public servant, and no matter what here people think about you in one way or another, I wanted to thank you for that and everything you've done for the country. I think there's a quote where you say, um, you know, don't assign things to malice when you could assign them to good intentions, but, you know, mirror bureaucracy or confusion. And my overall take in doing a lot of research on things involving you over the past several years is it's not coming from a place of malice and that you've always been working hard on it. But that said, when it comes down to it, you have to start right where a lot of this matters the most, and it's in the campaign of 2016. Um, so... You chose to speak publicly multiple times about the investigation of Hillary Clinton's email server at a press conference, during congressional testimony, via two letters to Congress. And this was just in the days before the election. This is directly contrary to clear precedent and guidance in the Department of Justice. We'll get to uh, that, I guess. About, we will, right? Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> about whether or not you should speak publicly about an instance of this, in particular when it hasn't been referred for a prosecution. Um, this is a fact that you've been admonished for by the Inspector General. So I'm positive you've had that question asked a hundred different times, a hundred different ways. My question is this, all of those things known and the fact that we now know at the same time President Trump's campaign was under investigation, under FISA collection. That's the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. We'll talk more about that next. Um, why the two different treatments of two candidates in the exact same campaign 
in circumstances where, at least arguably, in this, the case of the Trump campaign, it's more serious as opposed to just an email server. So why the different treatment of the two campaigns in this case? Yeah, no, it's a reasonable question. Thank you for asking it. And thank you all for the conversation we're gonna have tonight. I promise you honest answers about anything you ask. The, the difference laid with the type of cases that they were and the, the place in which they were. The challenge all along of the Clinton investigation, which was not about her use of a server, it was about whether she had mishandled classified information. The challenge all along was gonna be, if it ends with no charges, how do we explain that in a way that the American people believe it was done in a credible way? The Obama Justice Department giving a clean bill of health to the Democratic nominee for president during the election year, how do we do that, end that in a way that maintains faith and confidence, which is the bedrock of the FBI? And so that was something I struggled with, I know Loretta Lynch struggled with, Sally Yates struggled with, and so I'll, I'll spare you the details of the decisions, but all of those decisions were based on choices to try and achieve a result most consistent with our practice, I disagree with the predicate of your question, and with okay. maintaining public faith and confidence. Okay. The difference was it was a criminal case that ended in July, and then you're right, I went up to Congress and in the face of a whole lot of lying by Republicans, defended the work of the Justice Department and the FBI, and so it was done. We had announced publicly that it began back in the fall of 2015. Yes. And so as we do in cases of tremendous public interest, we not only announced the closing, but we offered transparency details, which we've done many, many times. The difference was I stepped away from the Attorney General to offer that transparency, and that's a decision I never could have imagined making. And if people wanna ask about the whys behind that, I'll get into that. Mm -hmm. But we were done with that investigation. Now contrast that with the investigation that we began on July 29th, not into the Trump campaign, not into the candidate himself, but into four Americans who had been associated with his campaign in some way or another to try and figure out, is there anything to the smoke we smell? Is there anything that would indicate that Americans are helping the Russians? Mm -hmm. We had just begun that in the end of July, and I actually don't remember a conversation about whether to disclose that publicly okay. for a few reasons. Like, what would we say? We've just begun this yes. thing. We don't know if there's anything there, but we have a basis to investigate. Mm -hmm. It's classified. Yeah. The hard thing that summer was President Obama's decision. Do I tell the American people about what the Russians are doing? That's right. But that's I the was, difference. Uh, at the time, I was Pentagon chief of staff, so totally lived through that experience the summer of 2016, reading all the intelligence in the president's daily brief, understand that part. Um, and again, you know, when someone in the audience hears you say it would have been difficult to figure out how to talk about the investigation of the Trump campaign, and they know it was very difficult to talk about the investigation into Hillary Clinton's campaign, the logic is different. But it wasn't. I mean, the Clinton campaign, the investigation related to Secretary Clinton came to us publicly at the FBI. And even then we refused to talk about it for three months. Finally, in the fall of 2015, mm -hmm. we confirmed only that we had an investigation because the whole world knew it already. Mm -hmm. And then we didn't speak again until it was completed or we thought it was completed, the yeah. nightmare would follow. But we thought it was over mm -hmm. in July of 2016. The counterintelligence investigation had literally just begun, didn't know whether we had anything, and didn't, the candidate was not the target of the investigation. We didn't have any yeah. information that the candidate was involved right. in an effort like that. But they, they were advisors on the campaign, in this case, Carter Page in particular. It started in July of 2016. And right, the follow-up question yeah, would be, um, from the research I've done, there were cases in which you were asked under oath in testimony to Elijah Cummings in this case, about whether there were any open investigations into the Trump campaign. Now, maybe technically you're right that there were not to the campaign, but these individuals definitely were advisors to the campaign, working the campaign in Trump Tower. Why not in a classified setting brief the House or the Senate Intelligence Committees or someone else? Oh, we did. We briefed the leaders of both the Democrat and Republican leaders of the two intelligence committees, we briefed the Speaker of the House and the minority leader. 
And so, and we told them we have this going on, uh -huh. but we don't know whether there's anything to it. The candidate is not the target. Carter Page is a peripheral advisor, mm -hmm. but we're trying to figure out, is there anything to the smoke we smell? We got information okay. yeah. that the Russians had spoken and offered help to a guy named George Papadopoulos through right. a, a, another individual. Yes. And we see this massive Russian effort. Mm -hmm. We need to, which is our job, figure out, is there anything to that? And that work is underway. And when I got fired in May of the next year, yeah. I still didn't know the answer, yes. whether there was anything to that. I finally got permission from the Justice Department to confirm that there was an investigation in the spring of 2017. Uh -huh. And so I actually think the different treatment illustrates the consistent principles that we apply mm -hmm. in deciding whether to talk about an investigation. Is there a compelling public interest? Yes. Is, it, is it at a stage where disclosing it would jeopardize ongoing investigation or not? What does the public already know about it? And who is the target or subject of the investigation? Mm -hmm. And if you apply all of those to the two different ones, you can actually see that it makes sense that we didn't even have a conversation yeah. in the summer of 16 about talking about the one we yeah. had just begun. Okay. And um, one other thing that you mentioned, and then uh, a little follow up on what this means now. Mm -hmm. um, so you said that you, you briefed the Gang of Eight, the intelligence committees on the foreign intelligence, the counterintelligence investigation at the time. In my experience in DC, and what I always teach my students in my class, is that everything always leaks. So it's shocking, quite frankly, that you briefed all of those members of the Hill, and that seemed not to have leaked at all. Um, yeah. Is there, this is hard for you to explain. I mean, you don't, can't prove a negative on why not that, but it is pretty striking that something that politically radioactive was not in the public domain by a leak or otherwise. Yeah, I mean, in particular from the Hill, which I think leaks all the time. Not the Gang of Eight, though because there is a history to that relationship with the executive branch, the intelligence community, sure. there's a, a, an implicit bargain with the Gang of Eight. We will yeah. tell you all of our most sensitive stuff mm -hmm. and you will protect it, yeah. especially if it relates to ongoing investigations yes. or operations. And so I would imagine that the Gang of Eight had the same concern we did, which is if we start talking about this, mm -hmm and alert the people that we're looking at, we may never be able to establish that they were working with the Russians. Right. You can see a echo of this in a letter that Harry Reid sent in September or October of 16. Okay. We wrote it, I think to me and to John Brennan, uh -huh. saying, I'm aware that you have information of an explosive nature that relates, that's be highly relevant uh -huh. uh, to the Russian, invest the Russian interference. Yeah. I think he mostly meant information on the CIA side and not ours, but I okay. took that as an echo of it. But look, most stuff leaks yes. eventually. Yes. But I was just talking about Jack Goldsmith up here. The standoff we had at Ashcroft's hospital yeah. bed did not leak. Yeah, don't ruin it yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Going there. We're good. No, 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 that's like history, 2004, but we'll go there too. Um, you know, again, interesting to me, if there's something in that letter, you have to look at the press every now and then. I wonder why the press didn't pick up on that, but I guess that's just something we'll always wonder. What I'd like to, to ask now is, recently the Attorney General um, just issued new guidance on exactly the same scenario. So whereas before, you did have discretion to make a judgment call on whether or not to divulge this type of information about a candidate. Um, the precedent and the guidance had been not to. In this case, the Attorney General has just changed to very explicitly say that the director of the FBI or the National Security Committee should not go public with any information related to a political figure without both the underlying information and now, which is new, the approval of the Attorney General. Could you talk a little bit about what that might mean in this upcoming election sure. and for the future of democracy because I don't have to tell you, you can see that could set up a political conflict of interest that could be bad for democracy. Yeah, so it's a good question. I understand his directive to be a little different than what you said. <clears throat> it's always been the case that the Department of Justice operates under a couple different norms, a lot of norms, but two that are relevant here. One is, in matters of intense public interest, where reasonable concerns about an investigation would arise in the minds of the public, we try and offer details. After Ferguson, 
we published an 80-some page report explaining why there weren't going to be any charges in Ferguson. After the allegation of IRS targeting, we did something similar because the public had a legitimate concern about whether the work was being done well. The second norm is if we can avoid it, we take no action that might have an impact on an election. That's always been the norm. It's not a rule. It doesn't have to be. If you can put off a search warrant, put off an arrest without jeopardizing a case, you do it because we don't want any part of elections. Yes. And so navigating those norms is a real challenge. Sure. As I understand what the Attorney General has said is nobody can open an investigation of a candidate, of a political party, of a campaign without first getting sign off from the Attorney General. My reaction is, geez, I don't know what problem you're trying to solve there because while it's technically true that the FBI opened an investigation of, for example, at the end of July of these four people associated with the Trump campaign, yeah. we did it in close coordination with the Department of Justice. They knew what we were doing. Yes. And if the AG of the DAG didn't want us doing it, they could have just said so. And so I don't know what additional protection is gained by having the AG have to sign off. And right. I worry mm -hmm. it introduces a, an explicitly political element yeah. to a sensitive investigation. And so, like, how would it look if yes. Loretta Lynch had said, yeah, because Hillary Clinton's the candidate, I'm not going to sign okay. off on the investigation. Right. So would it ever happen that she would reasonably withhold her consent? No. And so it brings into the House of the Attorney General a risk that's going to create maybe so doubt in the public's mind as to yes. whether this is being done in an independent way. Mm -hmm. my, my personal analysis along the lines of what you just said is, um, for all of you who don't know, in general, the director of the FBI is a nonpartisan figure. So lately, sometimes it's been hard to see that tradition. But even in the case of Jim, when he was the director of the FBI, remember, this is someone who's been a lifelong registered Republican during the Bush administration, was deputy attorney general, mm -hmm. um, then becomes director of the FBI during the Obama administration. So this non-political national security figure has always been an important part of American democracy. And if you then have that person reporting to an openly political appointee on either side, Democrat or Republican, it injects some measure of politicalness into this that I think could be um, worrisome. And well, you, you can imagine scenarios just in the current election in which an investigation could be tamped out that otherwise would have gone forward. Yeah, and the FBI has detailed cookbooks about when you can open an investigation, mm -hmm. what you have to have to open it, and what you can do once you open it. So I'm not sure what adding a layer of political appointee approval does. Mm -hmm. But look, and I get, I get this from my own family because I'm married to a, a woman who was a very strong Hillary Clinton supporter. But I know you all laugh, but, but if you dig into the details of, what we, of the decisions I made in 2016, you may think I'm a complete idiot, but I'm an honest idiot. And, and I did not make any decision for political reasons. The entire exercise, which was a nightmare I can't awaken from, was a series of choices between two doors, one of which sucked and the other which really sucked. And so choosing between, there wasn't an option like you can get off the stage here or you can, you can have a future where people don't recognize you in airports. I would have taken that door. It wasn't available to me. And so the question was, between these two doors, which one is most consistent with your values as an institution? And I promise you, th the choice of the doors never, ever had anything to do with politics and was an effort to maintain the faith and confidence of the American people in light of extraordinary polarization and facts that you couldn't have imagined in 500 years. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, not, I'm sure we're not going to get into the details of it, but dive into it and ask yourself what you would have done in my situation. You might have done something different, but holy cow, you can't say it was an easy call. No, that's for sure. Thank you for taking the time to explain it. Um, moving on now, this is to talking about domestic surveillance. And forgive me for a second, you know this very, very well. Um, but this is about the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. In the United States, there are often cases in which the FBI, sometimes in conjunction with the National Security Agency, will want to do electronic surveillance of foreign targets in the United States. To do that, they have to put in essentially a very large warrant application, several hundred pages from those I've seen during my time in government. 
um, which then go to a foreign intelligence surveillance court. This is not, despite half of Cambridge and a lot of conspiracy theorists, an uber secret court that you know, authorizes illegal things. It's normal judges who are a normal judge in their real life. They go to this court, it is classified, they review a classified submission, and they make a determination as to whether or not the FBI or the NSA can conduct domestic surveillance of a target. There are a whole bunch of legalese for the, the standards. But in general, this has been a very reliable process um, with the exception of one instance I'm gonna talk about, which is a pretty significant one, since the 1970s. And you remember the history there where, um, you know, very senior political people were under surveillance by the FBI and the NSA. So I, I want to tell a little bit of a story, which is in 2004, I had just graduated from the Kennedy School, then went on to work on the Hill on the Senate Intelligence Committee. Um, I was a professional staffer. I was doing oversight of the counterterrorism portfolio, which meant that at the time I had oversight as one staffer for a scandal that was going on with domestic wiretapping or domestic surveillance, as you want to call it, warrantless wiretapping. Um, I was working for Chuck Hagel, a Republican, believe it or not. Uh, and at the time, we read a story about this mysterious figure named James Comey, who ran to the hospital room of the attorney general at the time and prevented him from signing a reauthorization of this domestic surveillance order that had been put in place by the Bush White House. Because with the support of Jack Goldsmith, who now uh, teaches at the law school, you believed that the legal precedent and the legal underpinnings of this were in question, and you also didn't want the Attorney General at the time, John Ashcroft, to be signing something when he's literally like in intensive care. Um, so you obviously have taken that very seriously. That was during the Bush administration, a Bush appointee. Now, fast forward to something that happened recently where the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court um, after reviewing information from the inspector general said that the FBI, and this was during the time you were the director, uh, inappropriately submitted these FISA applications to the court. And some of the language that the judge, uh, this is Rosemary Collier, the presiding judge. And remember, this is just a normal judge, not some sneaky freaky secret court judge. Said the FBI's actions were antithetical to the heightened duty of candor and calls into question whether information contained in other FBI applications is reliable. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? You're the director of the FBI. Clearly, you're the one who signs the FISA application in or review it, especially in a high profile case. The case we're talking about is the surveillance on the Trump associated campaign advisors. Can you talk to us about that? What went wrong with that process? And why now are people calling into question both the reliability of the FBI and whether or not this domestic surveillance program is legitimate? Yeah. And what did you learn from all that when you reflect back on it now? So the, the FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act process is the way in which in the FBI's case, we get authority to conduct wiretapping in our national security cases. And it's ex parte, meaning there isn't somebody on the other side litigating against the government. So it's really important yeah. that when the government makes a presentation to the court, we're fair and transparent and include stuff that might undermine our representation that we have probable cause, which is the standard for a criminal case or a national security case. And it looks like in this particular FISA application that related to one individual among the four that we are investigating, there were significant omissions and mistakes. And it's very bad for the reasons that the judge said. There's a heightened duty of candor and accuracy when there's not somebody on the other side is gonna be challenging and litigating against it. And so the most important question is, how did that happen? That is, is it some problem with this particular case, this one subject, this one FISA application, or is there something broader? And there have been problems. Your description of it was a little too optimistic or rosy for the FBI. There have been problems over the last two decades, 
two and a half decades, right around the time of 9-11, there were a bunch of problems found in FISA applications, and we tightened up, this is before I got there, we tightened up the procedures, added levels of review, all kinds of stuff. And so when they would land on my desk in the morning, they were, as you said, really thick. And I knew that all kinds of people had reviewed this, lawyers and non-lawyers, and there's checklists. And so I had confidence in these things. And in fact, I think I was overconfident because I knew the process is such a pain in the neck. And it turns out that at the lowest level in the investigation, the inspector general said, the case agent in particular is making judgments about what to include and not include. Mm -hmm. And that meant if he didn't include a fact that was bad for the government, nobody saw it all the way up to the top. And so all the layers of review made no difference. And so I think the inspector general and the, and the director now are doing exactly the right thing. Let's find out if it's a broader problem, because if it's a broader problem, that would drive a solution very different than if it's a problem just with this case. And you might say, well, how could it be one and not the other? Well, in an effort to keep both the Clinton case confidential and the Russia investigation confidential, we kept them close and had them staffed at a headquarters, which is unusual for the FBI. So it's possible that there's something about the deployment on this case mm -hmm. that created an environment that was inconsistent with what we want. But if it's more broad than that, then everybody with oversight responsibility in Congress and in the executive branch need to ask, so how could we make it better so we don't have problems like this? You're always gonna have problems when people are involved but how do we maximize our chances of candor and openness with the court? Mm -hmm. So look, I found the IG's report great in a lot of ways. The president had been lying about the FBI for over two years. There was no spying, there was no political vendetta, there was none of the things he said, but the inspector general found significant errors all the way down at the investigative level that have to be, have to be dug into. Um, in my experience in looking at these FISA applications, because Interestingly enough, they also come through the Department of Defense mm -hmm. at a cabinet level review when you're the chief of staff. You review everything the secretary or the deputy secretary will sign off on. Um, we would go through a series of questions. Clearly, we're just you know really a tangential actor, but because NSA is part of the Department of yep. Defense, that was our involvement. Talk a little bit about, and maybe in this case in particular even, you're the director. What would you do from a due diligence perspective to try to ask the hard questions about those underlying facts, to try to get down to, especially in something so sensitive. So we just heard you say, which is right, in the first question, this was an extremely sensitive case. Those are the ones where the leader of the organization always gives extra due diligence and accepts a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. too. Can you talk through that yeah. process? The director- For you personally, when you were, when you were working on this. Sure. The director of the FBI, the role is actually quite limited when it comes to FISA. The statute requires the director certify two things. A significant purpose of the surveillance is to gather foreign intelligence information. And second, that alternative investigative techniques will not be sufficient. We need to go to electronic surveillance, that's it. But even though that's the limit, and to support even that, uh, signing off on that, I would get a memo that would summarize all the facts yeah. and have a list of who had checked it off, who had reviewed it. Because as director, you can't know the facts seven layers below you, but yes. you can know the process. In this case, I read, I know I read the first one because I knew that anytime you're conducting an investigation that touches a political campaign, it's very sensitive. So I read it, the whole thing, and then met with my general counsel to say, what concerns do you have? What, do you, what are you worried about? Mm -hmm. To get the briefing from him. But I didn't go down and interview seven layers down mm -hmm. the investigators doing the work. Right. And I, even in hindsight, I'm not sure that would make sense for Those the director of the FBI. Those are difficult things to do in a big bureaucracy like well, that. Well, again, but again, uh, I was yeah. overconfident yes. in, I knew the layers of bureaucracy that had been built since 9-11 to make sure we didn't have yeah. problems. And in some ways, and this I'm just speculating here, but I'll be interested to know whether part of the problem was everybody assumed somebody else was checking that. it. Mm -hmm. Because there literally are dozens of people involved in the process. And so is there something about that diffusion of accountability that yeah. creates a problem? And would we be better off with a system where the case agent, right, who's doing the investigation, comes in front of someone and says, I, this is me, I swear that this is full and complete and accurate but I don't want to jump to a solution until I know we know what the causes are. Mm -hmm.
Um, is it fair to say in general that this type of domestic surveillance, which is authorized by law, is really important as a national security tool for combating terrorism, cyber crime, cyber threats? Oh, sure. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to have some vehicle to conduct surveillance of agents of foreign powers in the United States. So right. let's pick the Russians. Yes. Right? You have to have some ability to conduct electronic surveillance that touches on mm -hmm. the Russian efforts to subvert our democracy and to spy on us. Exactly. And, but you want it to be regularized. I mean, what led us astray in the 1960s and 70s was that the notion at the Justice Department was there's a separation. For criminal cases, we follow the, the rote applications, we go to federal judges, but for national security stuff, we don't have to do that because that's, that's an exercise of the president's core powers. And what FISA did was say, no, given that this can be abused, if you're that loosey-goosey, yeah. we want it all to be regularized. Right. That's really important, but you need the capability. And so it'll be up to Congress and the executive yeah. branch to figure out, are there ways to change and improve FISA without losing the capability? So this is where it becomes dramatic because in something you may never have predicted you would see in your life, President Trump and the ACLU agree on something, which is that on March 15th in Congress, the reauthorization of the act that authorizes the Foreign Intelligence Surveil Act comes up to a vote. So Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham, no surprise, has said, because he's fronting for the White House and the president, that He's opposed to reauthorization of this, and we have to look at some different instantiation. As I said, um, a lot of far-left progressives also against this. So could it be the case, Jim, that by mid-March, with this unusual coalition, the act is not reauthorized? And just when we're learning that, again, the Russians are attacking our democracy, going after the election, and possibly, another question I may have if we have time, even trying to support the candidacy of President Trump or maybe Bernie Sanders, depends on what you believe, um, that we'd be blind. What, so the bottom line is, what's your call? Will Congress reauthorize it or not? And if not, what does that mean? Congress will reauthorize it. I'm highly confident of that because people across the political spectrum understand that as a country, we need this capability. We don't want to conduct electronic surveillance in the United States without a framework of law, but we have to conduct it to understand what the enemy is doing to us. But there may be ways to do it better and differently. And so I would, the challenge is it's really complicated, requires nuance, mm -hmm. and this is not an administration with a gift for nuance. And so, uh, what, I would ex what I would expect. Mm, I'd, I'd say the Hill is not particularly adept at nuance and anything. Yeah, that's passing fair. laws either. That's fair. Right. There, there's yeah. not, nu not a lot yeah. of nuance anywhere. But, <laughs> but I would imagine what they'll do is they'll reauthorize it with some sunset provision mm -hmm. and say we're only reauthorizing for three years to give us a chance to figure out, which I'm totally in support of. Uh -huh. Are there ways to make this okay. better to protect the, the integrity of the system, to give Americans confidence? that the facts that pertain to any investigation are making their way to the judge who's deciding this. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm totally supportive of exploring that. But anybody who looks at, I don't care whether you're a Democrat or Republican or neither, if you understand how this is used, no responsible person would vote to do away with it entirely. Hmm. And so let's figure out how to fix it if it's, if it's broken in ways we can get our head around. The political person in me says no responsible person could be interpreted in many different ways in our country nowadays, but we'll see. Yeah, but see, in Congress, I, think, I mean, I've spent a lot of time with the yes. intelligence committees on both the House and the Senate, mm -hmm. and they have different personalities, and the, sometimes it's like meeting with a divorced family, having dinner by court order, but, but Democrats and Republicans, they've spent enough time in those committees understanding the particulars. Right. They get the threat. They get the threat. Yeah, I totally agree. On the committees, they're very smart, you know, and the broader Senate, I guess we'll have to see how it goes also in the House. Um, so in the Kennedy School, I have a tradition, at least in my class, of flashing data or information or chart and then saying, explain. Uh, so I'm not going to flash the chart, but I'm going to give you some data and ask for your hypothesis on this. Um, 
anyone in the audience so I don't even just get heard chart. right I know like you have to have a pop quiz especially mm. from Rosenbach it's the way I operate um, you get cold called even the right. students in my class this morning were half terrified when I walked in and started cold calling right, I'm ready um, anyone who just heard all of the conversation up until now would probably reflect on the fact that there's a grave perceived loss of trust in the FBI. So here's my question to you. Um, do you think that's true? And if I asked you to give your best hypothetical guess on the polling on Americans' trust in the FBI, what would you hypothesize that is? And don't worry, there's a reason that we're going to this. It's not just Stump, the former director of the FBI. No, no, no. I, again, I don't know the data, but I would guess that it is higher than many other institutions in American life, but it's lower than it was three years ago for two reasons. Mm -hmm. First, decisions that I made hurt the FBI, and that's important. It's just, I still believe, as pain, I wish, I mean, I can't wake from this nightmare, but I still believe if I'd chosen the other door, I would have hurt the FBI worse, but there's no doubt. I knew we were spending the FBI's credibility. Forget me, I knew it was bad for the FBI. S second, the President of the United States has lied about the FBI for two years, and a healthy part of democracy is that citizens believe when the President says something. And so millions of people believe it when the President lies about the FBI. And that's really bad, but it has a real effect. And so I don't know the numbers, but I would guess the numbers confidence has declined, although it's still more trusted than other parts of our government. Oh, it's a pretty good instinct. So I have to admit when I saw the polling on this, this 2019 Gallup poll, um, trust and confidence in the FBI in 2019 at 57% of the American public, which is far higher than what I thought, below 20% for Republicans, above 60% for Democrats, which also I was kind of shocked by when you think about some of the things we just talked about. But I think to me, it's something that's reassuring that Americans do see through a lot of the political noise and they do continue to have trust and confidence in both the investigative and national security. But that's part still of the bad FBI. though. Right? No, think it's about bad. That. Well, but think about why it but all things so are relative. The military is always very high, but if you look at trust and confidence in Congress, I think it's at 12%. Um, the White House, it's something else. Other places in government. So all things considered in the era we live in, which is really important when you're at the Kennedy School. That's why we're here. It's to serve in the public space. We don't want people to lose hope, right? But Congress doesn't have to stand up before a jury and raise its right hand and say, I found these documents in the sock drawer of the CFO of this fraudulent company yes. and be believed. I mean, the danger of the president's lies about the FBI is at the margins, at doorways, in courtrooms, when men and women rise who are good people and say, I saw this, I heard this, I found this, and not some, some short of a 90%, of a, of a so I, I don't know how high it was in the past, but let's say only 50% or 57% are gonna say, I trust her. Hmm. I trust her because she's a part in American life. Because what's happening with the lies is, it's the president's effort to have people see the FBI as part of the partisan tribal warfare yeah. and identify them as Republicans or Democrats. That's a disaster for this country because the Bureau has to be a part. It's flawed, it makes mistakes, it can always be improved, but its great strength is it's different. It's separate from this mess. And because it's separate, those men and women are believed in courtrooms and at doorways, mm -hmm. and that matters to all of us. Yeah. That's why this is so important. Great. Um, probably the last question, because we have a lot of good questions from the audience here. Um, it's always important to look close to home here, and recently here at Harvard, uh, there was some law enforcement action against senior Harvard faculty who were, I'll use my term, inappropriately cooperating with the Chinese government in research. That on top of the fact that I am positive that um, Chinese intelligence agents, like they do around the country, are trying to steal secrets from Harvard from a research perspective, intellectual property perspective. Can you talk about that a little bit as a national security issue? And what should we at Harvard learn from the fact that even you know, distinguished faculty in our own ranks are doing something inappropriate like that? 
Yeah, I inappropriate. I'm, you, you see, I'm lawyer enough to know I'm not making any comment that has anything to do with legality. Well, I don't know the particular case, so I can't comment on the case, but I can say in general, foreign adversaries, the, the Chinese government being highest among them, want to collect things from the United States so that they see as in their national interest. A lot of it is traditional espionage, what's the government doing, what are the, what are the key data that the Commerce Department is gathering or something, but a fair amount of it, especially when it comes to the Chinese government, is what we would consider intellectual property, in part because they don't accept our dichotomy between public and private. It's one of the real challenges in our conversations with the Chinese government, was we would say, you can't steal for private purposes. They would say, we don't, we don't accept your division because we see a paint formula as we see an aircraft. It's all in the interests of the, the People's Republic. And so what do we do? As Americans, what we have to do is just sensitize our academic communities to, to know this is going on. It's sort of like with my own children. I'm a very depressing parent because I try <laughs> to have them know, look, there is darkness in the world. Right? Evil has an ordinary face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a, it's really a nightmare to be with one my, of my kids. kids. It's listen, forced listening to NPR on the way to school, and they're did, like, "Daddy, please stop quizzing me on the news." Okay, well, I'm a little darker <laughs> than NPR, <laughs> but our here's the challenge: our academic community is, in a way, like the the seven year old wandering out. Everyone's a friend, and that's a great thing in a way because it's a culture of openness. But what we have to do in places like the FBI is simply sensitize the academic community to know everyone's not a friend. And some people want to collaborate to develop better ideas, better formulas, but some people are working for an adversary to steal your stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's easier to describe in the abstract than to say what you should do about it, but just being aware of it is the first step. Yeah. And it's, it's lumpy across the country. There's some university communities, and even within universities, mm -hmm. where people get the, the presence of the threat more than in other places. Knowing about it can, can help us get to a healthier place. If I were a devious political operative, I would just say, Jim Comey just said Harvard faculty are like lost seven-year-olds looking like a friend. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not, so. <laughs> um, I meant it as a compliment, right? <laughs> Those, those top, <laughs> those young people hug everybody. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah. It is, yeah. Um, we're, I, I, I want to get to the point where... <laughs> faculty hugs everybody. Don't way. worry. We, we all need a little humbling yeah. around yeah. here. Uh, we want to get to questions from the students. Um, but again, I just wanted to thank you for your public service. Thank you for your candor here tonight. I do think it's very respectable, um, everything you've done in your career, and also that you've been so willing to come here, answer pretty hard questions, um, and just help people learn about things that matter today a lot. And with that, I wonder, you've spent so much time in public service. Um, over the last past several years, has it, has it diminished your perspective on whether or not you know, all the students in the audience here should go into government, should work for the FBI, should do something in the public arena? No. It's actually increased, two things have happened. Increased my desire to try and talk to people about public service, and then the reaction has given me a tremendous sense of optimism. I didn't expect to get fired, and that may surprise you, but I was at a place where I really didn't think I was gonna get fired, and so I was stunned when I found out from television that I was fired. And, <laughs> and, and it took me a while to figure out what I was gonna do, and my wife helped me figure it out. I said, I'm so worried the young people are gonna look at the public square today and decide it's so awful, it's so icky, I'll step back. And that would be a tragedy for this country. And so I said, maybe I can be a small part of trying to show people not because I was any kind of perfect leader, but I've seen great leadership and bad leadership, and there's a lot of good ethical leadership out there. So maybe if I show that, it'll help inspire people to participate. And the good news is I wasn't needed. That I've tried to do that in teaching and in speaking, and there's a television movie. My, one of my daughters said, don't use the term TV when you talk to young people, Dad. They won't <laughs> understand it. But there's a streaming event coming. Um, <laughs> You're doing it right now. <laughs> based based uh, on my book. And that freaked me at first. But the reason I think it's a good idea is it'll give more people exposure to some of these ideas that it matters. And you should participate. 
The good news is people are stepping forward. When I go to campuses and have sessions for people who are considering public service, they're wildly oversubscribed because everybody gets something that Albert Einstein told young people. Try not to become people of success. Try to become people of value. And there is value in that work. You're never going to get rich except in all the ways that matter most. And so I, I think I mentioned this backstage. I do a depressing thing with my students. I ask them to write on a card your sentence. Your life ends today. What's the sentence that will summarize your life? And don't give it to me. Don't turn it in at the end of class, but keep it. And then update it because that's what matters and that will show you the difference between success and value because I guarantee on that card, for most of you, it's not gonna be anything about money or human honor or houses or cars. It's gonna be about making a difference with the gifts that you have and if you're in this room, you have, you have gifts that you can help other people by using. And so I, I urge you to participate. We need you so badly. You can live a life of extraordinary value and you will be glad at the end of that life that you made that choice. The tragedy of this era of ours would be that talented young people step away and our government is hollowed out because we don't have quality people participating. We need you. I think I'm pushing on an open door. Please participate. Yeah, okay, Boomer, we screwed it up. Uh, <laughs> fix it for us. Participate in the life of this country. Make it better because you can. Great. Thank you. This yeah, is very thanks. well said, John. Yeah. Okay. We still have uh, a good bit of time here. And again, what I would like is if we could have students only asking questions. You all know the way this goes. Uh, a question is an interrogative. That means it's not a speech. If you need to open it with an important fact or observation that when you want to be effective is one or two sentences and a question. So with that, please, if you're not a student, could you step aside? If you are a student, welcome. And yes, sir, we'll start right here. Also for Jim, could you just say who you are, you know, where you're from and very brief uh, background. Hi, my name is Paul Bismarck. Um, I'm a student here at Harvard. So I'm a job. student. <laughs> Um, but most importantly, I'm a wounded combat veteran of the United States Army, retired wounded combat veteran. So uh, I'm also an immigrant, so yeah, you can tell by my accent. I want to say thank you for your service, and thank you too, sir, for your service to this wonderful country of ours. Thank my you. question relates to the Motor Report, right? So if the Motor Report was the James Comey Report, would it be anything different, the conclusion of the Motor Report, would it be different from what we got from the Motor Report recommendation to Congress and to the American people? And lastly, is there any area of investigative area that you are pursued that you think that within the Motor Report it wasn't pursued? I, so I do have a view and I think it would be different, but having had a fair amount of uh, second guessing directed at myself, I hesitate to do this, but I'm gonna do it to Bob anyway. Um, I. I think it would be different, again, with the benefit of hindsight in two ways. The first is Bob Mueller and his staff try to do something fair and principled, which I admire. Their view was, because you can't indict a sitting president under Justice Department policy, we shouldn't accuse a president of a crime because that isn't fair. Because the president, having been accused of a crime, can't vindicate himself through the normal adversary process that a private citizen could, so we won't do that. We won't reach a prosecutive judgment. But in doing that and taking that stance, which makes sense in, in theory, I think they delivered the harm they sought to avoid. That is, they smeared the president by laying out the facts that, to my mind, established a powerful case for obstruction of justice, at least in a number of respects. And so they accomplished the harm they were seeking to avoid. But the way in which they presented it left it open for the attorney general to utterly distort, and the president to utterly distort their conclusions, to say there's no there there and we're done here. And so m if I had to do it over again, again with the benefit of hindsight, I would either not include any of the facts about obstruction or lay it all out and make the accusation because they essentially did that. That's the first way in which I think it would be different if I got the chance to do it. The second is I would communicate differently about it. And this may be a philosophical difference between me and Bob Mueller. He's more of a traditionalist who believes, and I respect this, that we should speak only through our work, only in the courtroom and only in our charging documents. And I'm much more in favor of transparency consistent with our principles, our norms, and our policies 
to facilitate public confidence and understanding. And so a 460-some page report is not the optimal way to facilitate public confidence and understanding, especially today. I read it twice. I doubt that's true of a lot of people in this audience. And so I would have tried to find ways to communicate. I don't mean through a set of memes or something, but I, <laughs> but I would have tried to find a way to communicate in the way Americans consume information today so that they could understand what I did. And whether that's video clips or something different than the 460 some page report. I don't know of another area of investigation. I think you all get this, but Bob did not take any of the counterintelligence piece of this. He left that with the FBI, and I don't know what happened with that. He took only the criminal investigative piece to figure out were there crimes committed, and if so, by whom. Questions about who might be working with Russia, subject to coercion by Russia, duress, influenced by Russia are counterintelligence questions, and those were left, and I don't know what happened. I don't know of anything on the criminal side that he would or should have investigated other than what's laid out in the report. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you for your service. Um, yes, sir. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Armin and I'm a student at the law school. And uh, especially today, we're uh, doing a class about end-to-end uh, -end encryption and how the implications of that has on surveillance from the FBI and NSA and especially the battles between FBI and Apple to unlock the iPhones. And you had some strong views in your time when you were a part of the administration, but I was wondering, since you left office, has your views changed on the matter and what they are currently? No, my views are, are the same. That is, I have a strong view that nobody should have a strong view about what the right answer is, but that we should all have very strong views that we have a real problem, that we are drifting to a place where this, the bargain at the heart of ordered liberty is becoming increasingly irrelevant. The bargain in the United States is your stuff and my stuff is private unless the people of the United States really need to see it. And then with predication and oversight, they can go through your sock drawer and your bank deposit box and your car trunk increasingly there most of our lives are off limits to that model because a judge can issue all the search warrants or orders that she wants we can't open the safe deposit box the, because it's it's my phone and so i believe that as fbi director i did a stupid thing as fbi director i did lots of stupid things as fbi director but this one really i, I regret doing it i entered the encryption debate in a dumb way I was on my way into one of my quarterly press roundtables when I saw that Google was advertising that they, like Apple, were selling a warrant-proof phone. And I just flipped out. I was like, okay, who could think that's a public good? I mean, maybe that's where we want to be, but how is that a great thing to create swaths of life where pedophiles and terrorists and criminals can't be caught? And so I walked in and I just blasted them. The reason that was dumb was, I knew how complicated the conversation is, and what I did was I fed a conflict narrative. Because the challenge of being in the media is, it's hard to write about complicated stuff, and if some knucklehead gives you a conflict narrative, you write about that. It's FBI against Google, FBI against Apple, Comey against Cook. And so it went there very quickly, and then San Bernardino just accelerated that. Somehow we have to step back from the conflict narrative and say, as Tim Cook and I have done privately when I was FBI director, we share the same values. We both care dearly about the security of our information, our, our IP, our secrets, our hopes and dreams, and we care deeply about the security of our country and our communities. Those things are in conflict. How do we resolve that? How do we optimize those two kinds of securities? And it's a seven-dimensional challenge, but we're not getting anywhere close to solving it now. We're just drifting. We're just drifting to a place where all of our lives are gonna be covered by strong encryption, and we will have changed the way in which we govern ourselves without ever actually talking about it. And Cook's view was, Apple shouldn't tell the American people how to live. And my view was, the FBI shouldn't tell the American people how to live. They should decide, but we're not deciding. We're just drifting. And so my views are the same, a little bit depressed. And I love my iPhone. So but all those things can be true. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yes, sir. And then if I could ask, Please, we've only had guys asking questions. Thank you. All right, actually, you're up. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Swathi. I'm a junior at the college. I'm a former 
uh, head of policy at the Institute of Politics. My question uh, revolves around a statement that you made uh, over and over again about how you made your decisions with the interests of integrity of the FBI in the eyes of the American people. So at the time when the American people, I would believe, are really divided, again, on a number of issues, what do you believe those values the Ameri of the American people you were appealing to, aside from perhaps a desire for sheer transparency? Well, the most important value when you're the leader of a justice agency, so either the attorney general or the FBI director, the lifeblood of the institutions is that the American people believe you're just, that they trust you, that they have faith and confidence that you're competent, independent, and honest, that, that justice really does have a blindfold and is not making decisions because of privilege or political position. That's, that's the absolute essential part of those institutions. And so, Obviously, that's the paramount value in those institutions. Then there's a number, obviously, the Constitution, the law, your norms, your, your traditions, your policies. But underlying all of that is, because all of those are supposed to be designed to facilitate the same value, is will the American people trust us? Because the American people lose confidence that the justice system is just. Where are we? And so I would say that, to my mind, is the highest principle. And I'll say one other thing about values, though. The cool thing about our country is we have a whole lot more in common than we realize, that we have tremendous policy disagreements, and that's, to my mind, important and kind of awesome. Above that, we have a set of values that we actually have in common at the highest level. And so trying to make decisions and have conversations that start there, in my mind, is the key to being an effective leader in government and to being an effective citizen. And too often, we start down here with our disagreements and it leads to unhealthy conversation. I've always believed it's hard to hate up close. And so finding a way to get up close and start the conversation at the values level is, whether you're a leader or not, essential to functioning in this society. Right. Okay, I think we have time for just maybe two more questions. We've got two more minutes. So, sir, right here, and then we'll go to you right there. Okay, sir, go ahead. Hi, my name is Ben Bolger. I'm a, an alum of the Harvard Design School and a graduate student. And uh, with all due respect, uh, there's a lot of students here and young people that I think volunteered or worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign. And among other things, they were excited uh, potentially to see a woman finally in the White House. Uh, and that did not happen. Uh, if Hillary was to her, and why or why not? I wouldn't. I, I would try to make sure, and, I, and I'm assuming she does now, understand what we faced and why we made the decisions that we made. And as I said, I mean this, I'm not being flipped, that if you really understand the position we were in, that I was in, on October 28th, you walk away saying, oh my God, that was a very hard decision. So I'd want her to understand that. Look, I, I, I wasn't being kidding either. I was married, and still am, thank God, uh, to someone who felt exactly as you said in your predicate of the question, that we, and I still believe, I actually believe this passionately, we need a woman to be president of the United States. And she did not understand what I was doing. And it caused her a lot of pain. But once she understood, she thought about it very differently. Secretary Clinton said in her book that I shivved her. That was painful for me. I've never met Secretary Clinton, but I wasn't trying to help her or hurt her. One of my very best people is a woman named Tricia Anderson, who was the deputy general counsel. As we were wrestling with what the right thing to do, which, which door is the one to choose on October 28th, she said, should you consider that what you're about to do may help elect Donald Trump president of the United States? And I said, thank you for asking that question. No, not for a moment, because that would be the end of the FBI as an independent force. If I start asking whose political fortunes will be affected in what way, we're done. We're done. We're not this separate thing. I have to lift my eyes and ask, given our values, our traditions, our practices, what's the right thing to do? And I can't consider who will be affected in what way. And that's the way we made that decision. And so I hope, if she, I'm not pitching my book, I don't care if you read my book, but I hope she's had a chance to at least read that or read something else that summarizes just what we faced on October the 28th. Thank you, good question. Okay, yes sir, and then I'm gonna get right behind you and you have the very last question, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for this discussion. My name is Short Chuck questions, Madden. shorter answers. Got it, okay. <laughs> 
My name is Chuck Nat. I'm a joint degree at the business school and the Kennedy School, and I'm a U.S. Army aviator. Um, I had a quick question about uh, something you said in 2016 at the San Diego FBI conference where you said that you were asked if you had done what uh, Secretary Clinton had done with the emails using private, a private email address, uh, would you be in trouble? And you said, you bet your ASS that you'd be in trouble. And then the IG report comes out, you know, a couple years later that says that you, it, throughout the course of the investigation, used a Gmail address. A lot of the people working on the investigation were using the Gmail address. Um, understanding that you said that with the knowledge that you were doing the Gmail, what, what do you tell people who, who see that, what they might call hypocrisy, who might not understand that difference yeah. between yeah. opinions? What, 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 would you, what would you tell the American people who see that and come out with a question mark? It's a reasonable question, quick answer. The Clinton case was about discussing classified subjects on an unclassified email system. Didn't matter whether it was Gmail, her own system, or an unclass government system. That's what the case was about. If I had done that as an FBI employee, or if you had done that as a US military employee, you'd be in trouble. You wouldn't have been prosecuted on the same facts as Secretary Clinton, but you'd have been disciplined if you were in the government. I never discuss classified information on an unclassified system, ever. And no one's ever said that I did. That's the reason for the difference. And you're saying that Secretary Clinton did. Oh, sure. She acknowledges she did. She talked about top secret stuff eight times, secret stuff 50 times. And the question was, when she did that, did she know she shouldn't be discussing it on that system? That's what that investigation was about. Thank you. To be fair, um, there are a lot of times when there are things that are top secret in your intelligence report that are also open on the New York Times that have not been leaked, and it's what the New York Times may say. So I do think there's always a little you know, gray space and things like that, not on whether you knowingly divulge classified information, but what is classified maybe. Yes, ma'am, you're the last question. You get to take us home here. All right. Um, my name is Erin Getzlow. I'm a freshman at the college, um, and I just wanted to ask, uh, I think that a lot of times uh, in the news, you're considered to be a very polarizing political figure as we've discussed tonight. Um, but I think that a lot of times that's because it seems as if you have at least made an honest attempt, regardless of what people think about your decisions, to prioritize your values and truth over partisanship. Uh, and unfortunately, it seems like a lot of political leaders right now and members of our government don't want to do that. So I guess my question is, for students like me who are interested in going into government someday, what advice do you have for trying to continue to prioritize integrity and truth over partisanship? That's a great question. Thank you. Know that you will die someday. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you will sit at the end of your life someday, and you will, God willing, have... If you want a family, have children, grandchildren around you, and you will explain yourself to them. I mean, even if you don't even have a family, you will explain yourself to yourself. And that perspective, I would hope, would help everybody. I knew I was totally screwed in making the decisions on October the 28th. I'm really proud of the way we made the decisions. Even if you think that you would have made a different decision, I'm really proud of the way we conducted ourselves. Personally, it was disastrous for me. A lot of people don't like me. Okay, but at the end of my life, I'm gonna tell my grandchildren, maybe my great-grandchildren, here's what I did and why, and I'm really comfortable with that. And so floating in time and looking back on hard decisions you're being asked to make, out of the storm, out of the media coverage, will help you make better decisions. And I'm disgusted by a lot of what I see in public life today by people making a decision like, I know what the president's doing is wrong, but I don't want to say it because it will hurt me in the short run. How are you going to explain that to your grandchildren? How are you going to explain that to yourself at the end of your life? I don't know. And I wish they would embrace a little bit more of that perspective and stand up and do the right thing. Right. Yeah. You all thank me. Jim, thank you again thank you. for making time for us tonight. Thank you for your service. I learned a lot. I know a lot of people here learned something too, and that's what this is all about. Great. Thank, thank you, you so all. Much. Thanks for coming. Right. Yep.